successful business in the German IT market for international companies. And we're going to look uh, at the legal aspects and in a second part especially on data protection issues as uh, this is a very hot topic right now, uh, uh, especially with uh, Safe Harbor and the EU-US uh, Privacy Shield. Um, so, um, in, in the first part, I'm going to give a rough introduction on the important legal aspects. It's going to be a short overview. We're going to take a brief look at contract and labor law issues, commercial and corporate matters, what is important for you if you come here to Germany, if you want to do business here in Germany. And then, um, in the second part, I'm going to hand over, first of all, um, to, to Rolf. He, he's going to take a brief introduction on IP law issues. And then um, I'm uh, continuing with uh, the data protection issues. So, overview of legal aspects. Um, if you're doing business here in Germany, um, um, this will, as you can imagine, affect many legal aspects, many uh, law areas. In the civil law sector, it will affect contract law uh, aspects. Um, for you, what is most certainly very interesting are questions of liability, of damages, but doing business in Germany can also affect tort law, labor law, commercial law, competition law, and as Ralph will tell you in a minute, uh, intellectual property law issues. In the public law sector, tax law is always very important for you if you come here into, uh, to Germany, and as it's a hot topic, data protection law. So, um, first of all, I want to uh, look at contract law. I have uh, three examples here for you um, that are of high relevance in the IT sector if you, wanna, uh, if you come to Germany, if you want to do business here. Uh, example number one are standard form contracts. Um, according to German law, surprising terms do not become part of the contracts and they are invalid if, and that's the key word, if they impose an unreasonable disadvantage. What is an unreasonable disadvantage? Well, that, is a, that has to be decided case by case. This cannot be decided just in one se uh, sentence. So we have to look on each contract, on each standard form contract, if there is an unreasonable disadvantage. Uh, number two, special rules protecting private customers. Um, they are of importance for you, um, especially in, in the area of distance contracts uh, concluded by means of distance communication. Um, this is all of high relevance for companies running web shops here in Germany. Um, and also we've got special obligations in electronic commerce. Um, uh, in this area, it is very important to provide reasonable, effective and accessible technical means. Um, there are also special obligations concerning websites for uh, when they are used for e-commerce uh, uh, um, purposes. So, another important uh, uh, area, labor law. Um, if you come to Germany, um, what is... Uh, different from US law, but also maybe from Australian law or from Swedish law, um, the termination of employment relationship. Here in Germany, we have, we've got the Protection Against Dismissal Act. Uh, hereafter, the termination by the employer is only allowed in a certain set of circumstances. And if you're an American company, this will for sure be very different from your law uh, in your country. So. Um, you need a certain set of circumstances if you want to uh, dismiss an employee and uh, these circumstances may include misconduct by the employee and also urgent business cases. As well, what is an urgent business case? That is also an issue that has to be looked on case by case. Also, please note that the dismissed employee has every time the option of bringing his case before the labor court. Um, personal leasing is also a hot topic here in Germany. Right now we have a proposal of a new German bill amending the law on personal leasing and we've got new delimination criteria between service contracts on one side and employment contracts. Um, for you as a company, uh, it is important uh, also to look at commercial and corporate law <coughs> issues. Uh, Commercial uh, uh, law are the rules, are special rules, only applicable to business people. 
um, the legal certainty provided by those rules is particularly important, of course, for e-commerce purposes. Um, in Germany, we've got a commercial register satisfying the need for publication of important information about merchants, about companies. And also what is a typical German institute is the so-called businessman's letter of confirmation, which may lead uh, to the fact that a contract can be uh, concluded hereby. Um, also, in corporate law, which is a broad topic, we've got various types of corporations under German law. Of course, private limited companies, but also stock, uh, uh, stock corporations and other companies. So, if you want to uh, form a German company as a foreign, uh, comp uh, as a foreign uh, uh, um, uh, company coming into Germany, you also, ha of course, have to look at the types of uh, 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 companies available under German law. So, um, Rolf, um, I'm going to hand over to you for, for the uh, middle part. Yes, if you want to enter the German market, uh, you have to find out whether your company name or your product name is already registered by other trademarks, uh, earlier trademarks in Germany. So, let's assume BMW would not be so uh, well known and would only be operating in Germany and would only have a German trademark and you would have a famous brand PMW uh, coming from the UK, let's say, or Australia or wherever and you want to enter the German market, uh, you have to really think about, uh, think twice whether you want to continue in German, uh, using your brand PMW in Germany for uh, cars, because there is an earlier trademark BMW. Um, you can search for these uh, earlier trademarks um, for free now, if you wanted to. Um, there is a database, a very handy database, uh, by the European Trademark Office, or uh, its uh, official name, its uh, um, Office for Harmonization in the Internal Market, but it, that's too complicated. It's in Alicante, where a lot of people spend their holidays, uh, they have a really nice location, and they operate a database called TMView. TMView, one word, if you Google that, or if you leave me your card, I can send you an email uh, with the link. Uh, you can search, um, you can put in your, uh, your product name or your company name and then you can check a box in advanced search called fuzzy search and then you can find uh, whether there are similar earlier trademarks in Germany. Of course, if you want um, 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 an opinion from me where I'm liable for uh, and uh, if I'm telling you, if, if you want me to tell you that it's no problem to enter the German market with a certain name, then of course I'd have to charge, but there is uh, this, this free uh, database that uh, usually gives very similar results to the, uh, the searches I can do for you. So, so check out this database, that's very, very useful. Um, so um, then there is one aspect uh, that if you, if you found a, a, a trademark that would be conflicting with your product names or your company names, uh, they, these trademarks might be, uh, you, can, you might be able to challenge these trademarks. Um, if a trademark is not used for in a, in a, time, of, a time frame of five years uh, and you find out that, okay, there is this earlier trademark and it's, it's registered, it could be a problem for me if I enter the German market. But if you find out that it's not used anymore and it has not been used in the last five years because they sold the company like seven years ago or whatever, um, then this trademark is probably not any more enforceable. So even if you found a trademark that is similar to your planned product name or company name in Germany, um, you might still be able to use that because the earlier trademark might not be enforceable uh, and might be, uh, you might be able to challenge that earlier trademark. So um, then trademark protection. Um, most likely you already have trademark protection in Germany because um, it's very common for a lot of companies to either have a European-wide trademark, a community trademark, a EU-wide trademark, or to have um, a trademark in their home market. Uh, let's say you come from the US or from Norway or some non-EU country. Um, and then you are able to register um, a so-called international registration. You go to WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office in Geneva, and you tell them, I have a, ma a trademark in my home country, let's say the US, and I want protection in a lot of different regions in the world, for example, the EU. 
Um, and most likely, if you are from a larger company, you already have that kind of protection, either a CTM, a community trademark, or an international registration with protection in Germany. If you don't, you should, because uh, you should register your trademark in Germany, either as a community trademark, international registration, or a national trademark. Because um, if you don't, someone else can do that and then tell you not to use the trademark. <laughs> that would be really bad, right? <laughs> so um, the least expensive way to do that would be a national trademark. But probably the most efficient way, uh, your company might already have an international registration. You can extend that international registration to Germany. So then, um, for those of you who are in, in some kind of technology field, and most of you are in the IT business, um, you might also want to check patents. Um, if you enter the German market, uh, you might want to make sure, um, also for compliance reasons, um, that your product is not infringing in patents that are valid in Germany. You know, Germany is a country full of inventors, and um, uh, as many other countries in the world, and uh, some of these patents might only be valid in Germany. So um, you might have already made a compliance check in other countries where you offered your services or products, um, but um, you did not check Germany uh, um, before that. So before entering the German market, you should make sure whether you, your new product is infringing in any of um, valid patents in Germany. So with that, I hand over to you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so in my uh, second part, we're going to now look at uh, the aspects of data protection laws. <coughs> they are of central importance when processing personal data. Um, we've got uh, not only in Germany, but rather in, uh, in Europe, uh, a very wide understanding of the term personal data. And currently, with regard uh, even to IP addresses, um, there's a clarification by the Court of Justice of, of the European Union expected for this year, 2016, um, following a referral from the German Supreme Court, the so-called Bundesgerichtshof. Um, let's take a look how data protection is regulated in the European Union. We, we've got data protection regulations on European level, and we've got uh, data protection regulations on the level of the national legislation of all 28 member states. Uh, which means uh, that if you, want to if you want to do business in Europe and if you want to comply with uh, data protection laws, um, you have to not only take into account the European uh, legislation, but also the legislation of all member states uh, you want to do business with, yeah? um, especially for very big companies who want to do, do business in, in all uh, European countries. This is a very difficult task because you have to take into account all national legislation of all 28 member states. Um, here in Germany, we've got uh, national data protection laws on federal level. Uh, we've got the Federal Data Protection Act. We've got sector-specific regulations, for instance, in the banking sector, and also we've got data protection acts, uh, acts on state level applying to public bodies and authorities of the respective state. Um, territorial scope is um, also very important for you as a uh, foreign company coming here into Germany because the Federal Data Protection Act is applicable not only to a data controller with a seat and establishment here in Germany, but also with a seat in a third country. And that is the case under the current law. Um, if uh, he, meaning the data controller, makes use of equipment, automated or otherwise, situated on the territory of a member state. Here in Germany, that can be the case if, you, if the data controller merely, uh, simply uses a server here in Germany. That would be an automated uh, an, a use of equipment here on German territory. Um, this will slightly change under the upcoming data, uh, general data protection regulation, which we expect for 2018. Um, this uh, regulation will apply to um, the processing of personal data of data subjects uh, by a controller or processor not established in the EU, and that's where the difference is, where the processing activities are related to the offering of goods and services 
or to the monitoring of behavior um, in, uh, of users in the U European Union. So there will be a slight change. But um, uh, the bottom line is German uh, federal data protection laws will regularly be applicable if you do business here in Germany, if you use servers here in Germany, or if you are under the uh, upcoming law, if you are directing your business to, uh, explicitly to German customers. So, um, we, uh, we will take a short look at the basic data processing principles um, where the uh, German DPA is applicable. Any processing uh, must comply with uh, the basic data protection principles and here in Germany the basic principle is contained in section 4 German DPA where after the collection, processing and use of personal data shall be admissible only if, and number one, um, the data subject has consented. So consent is very important. You can get consent f uh, in uh, standard form con uh, contracts, for instance, um, or if it is permitted or prescribed by the German DPA or any other legal provision and um, this uh, entire matter of legal justification is also a very broad topic. Um, for you as an international company, uh, most certainly the international data transfers are of uh, high importance. Um, the key word in this, um, in this context is uh, the adequate level of data protection. Um, which is required to legally justify international uh, data transfers. Um, to, um, we've got various possibilities to, to, to get such an adequate level of data protection. Uh, on the one hand, we've got adequacy decisions of the European Commission. So they are in place, for instance, for Canada, Argentina, Uruguay, New Zealand, Switzerland, and uh, some other countries. However, and that is important, especially in the safe harbor context, uh, we've got no such adequacy decision for the United States. Another um, uh, method of, uh, uh, of uh, obtaining such an adequate level of data protection are binding corporate rules and standard contract clauses. Um, and um, for the United States, we formerly had a safe harbor as a special solution because uh, w there was no adequacy decision in place for the United States. And after the uh, European Court uh, of uh, Justice has declared the uh, safe harbor decision, the Commission safe harbor decision as invalid, we are now uh, getting a new instrument which is called the EU US Privacy Shield for which the adequacy decision is currently under preparation. So, uh, on my final slide, uh, we're going to take a look at this uh, EU-US privacy shield. Um, I highlighted um, uh, a few points of this new mechanism for you. Um, number one, uh, we've got stronger obligations on US companies, um, a robust enforcement, an annual joint review is planned, um, both uh, from the US side and the European side, and uh, we've got uh, redress possibilities uh, and also a so-called ombudsman mechanism on the US side. Well, will it work? That we'll see in the upcoming years. Right now, the Article 29 Working Party is preparing its statement about the uh, EU-US privacy shield. So uh, we will, um, they announced it for mid-April, so that, uh, Judith, will also be time when we will update our Safe Harbor White Paper for ECO. Thank you very much, and um, Rolf. Yeah. Any uh, final words from your side? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you have questions. I have one question. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, in the uh, German market on the e-commerce side, mm. uh, there are a lot of. Uh, if you have to do all things right, not to be sued by consumers or by companies. There are a lot of vultures or trolls that sue you when. Uh, is there some like action on these sort of companies because it's uh, attracting uh, or attracting foreign companies to come in Germany is sort of like there's a wall because of these companies that attack you when you have not put it right. Uh, is there any movement on that? Because it seems not very single market European, single market minded. <laughs> 
uh, way of doing it. There, there are various movements on this. Uh, there are various or uh, there are various laws trying to target uh, uh, these sort of activities. Um, but uh, some of them have been successful, some haven't been successful, so it's always a, a, a game. Um, uh, others will hide and they will find new ways uh, in order to target you, but um, there is legislation targeting this. So if you have any specific uh, example, we can talk about it later. Yeah. I think um, the, the judges already um uh, addressed this problem a little bit. They lowered the recoverable fees, the legal fees, um, for certain types of abmahnungen of uh, warning letters. So um, it's not interesting anymore in many fields to send these warning letters. There was a question back there. Uh, it's a fresh one. Just anyone, would you elaborate what redress possibility means? Well, um, in the under the safe harbor framework, um, the European, European users had, uh, had uh, no, uh, no possibilities of enforcing uh, any violation of, uh, uh, of their personal data being, uh, being, um, um, being uh, processed on the US side. And, um, that is new under the privacy shield that European companies will have, or that European data subjects will have um, possibilities um, uh, to, to, to voice uh, their concerns uh, on the US sites. And one uh, uh, possibility is the ombudsman mechanism, which is uh, included, I think, in the Federal uh, Trade Commission. Uh, they, have, uh, they will uh, implement an ombudsman and as a Euro from the European side, uh, you can ad address and you can voice your concerns at this ombudsman mechanism. Um, this is, it's not very effective. It's, um, it's already criticized a lot, but it's new as the uh, safe harbor mechanism had no such uh, 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 mechanisms in place. And that was widely criticized for over 10 or 15 years. Do we have question for one single question? Or maybe there was one in the back and then you. Just the last two questions. Okay. Uh, do you agree that to know if the, if the privacy shield is uh, efficient or not, then we need uh, maybe uh, Mr. Snowden Jr. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do not know if the privacy shield um, is efficient. It's already uh, widely criticized. Um, after the European Commission uh, uh, had the press release uh, at the beginning of February, um, Max Schrems, who will be tonight at the uh, Cronus Night Talk here, here at the VHTs, um, he already uh, wrote on Twitter that it's another thing that he will bring to in front of the European Court of Justice. Um, um, it's, again, it's um, a political compromise. It has been reached within a very short period of time, three months from, now, uh, from uh, uh, October. It was uh, negotiated in that uh, very short time frame. So, uh, of course, it's not perfect, um, but uh, before we um, start criticizing it on a, on a large scale, we should wait and see what the Article 29 Working Party, um, what their opinion is on the EU, US privacy shield and um, how the um, adequacy decision uh, of the Commission then will be like. Yeah. One final last quick question. Yeah, so the obligation <laughs> in Germany to report uh, data leaks when you're being hacked. Data leaks? So, um, under the uh, upcoming uh, data protection regulation, there are um, new reporting duties and then you have to look. Um, you, you might have internal duties, uh, this is a question of compliance, um, where companies have to report internally or to uh, data protection uh, authorities. And um, uh, well, under the current uh, regime, but uh, this will last only for two more years. There are only, uh, if I can think of, a few reporting duties, especially in sp sector-specific uh, 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 branches, like in the banking sector. But um, the general data protection uh, regulation, or well, that's 
its aim uh, has intended to to uh, enlarge uh, or to to um, that there will be many more uh, such duties. Thank you both very much.